Jobs. And today we have the honor of having with us Professor Robin Dunbar. Professor Dunbar is an emeritus professor of evolutionary psychology at the University of Oxford, where his research primarily focuses on trying to understand the behavior of cognitive and neuroendocrinological mechanisms that underpin social bonding in primates generally and in humans specifically. Professor Dunbar is perhaps most well known for formulating Dunbar's number, the cognitive limit to the number of individuals with whom one person, any one person can maintain stable relationships. He has published numerous books, one of which is How Religion Evolved and Why It Endures, and that will be the topic of today's talk. Uh, Professor Dunbar will probe a series of questions behind the evolution of religion, which distinguishes humans from all other animals. He will discuss how religion helps to bond our unusually large social groups, which became increasingly important after we have started to live within large villages and towns around 8,000 years ago. Professor Dunbar will explain his theory that religion, based on ancient psychological, psychological traits, um, in playing a crucial role in forming friendships within communities, can produce a capacity to feel that we engage directly with mysterious forces that control the universe. And after all this, maybe finding a reason behind the extinction of non-religious Neanderthals. Without further ado, let us put our hands together for Professor Tom Bach. Thank you very much. I'm sorry to begin with uh, an apology for the fact that uh, I know nothing about theology. <laughs> got interested in the evolution of religion in a way by accident. Um, I suppose I probably always had some interest in religions because I grew up in East Africa in a very, very multicultural, multiracial environment where I was exposed daily really to probably every religion you could conceivably think of. But realistically, uh, I'm a behavioral ecologist um, uh, with a, a, a gloss of being a psychological neurobiologist as well, I suppose, but uh, primarily I see myself as a behavioral ecologist. I'm interested in why organisms and their traits evolve. And my real focus, I suppose, has come to be over the last I mean, 30, 40 years, maybe, um, the evolution of social systems in complex species, principally mammals, occasionally uh, birds. I have worked on dragonflies, which I can extol uh, what wonderful creatures are, uh, dragonflies are, we could spend the next hour on that, because they're really exciting. Uh, but uh, I kind of got interested in the evolution of religion, partly pondering why on earth it existed at all, and clearly it does, and we spend a lot of time and money and occasionally lives uh, as a result of it. Um, the question was, you know, here's something very costly, is not going to evolve as a kind of byproduct. There's a temptation among cognitive uh, scientists of religion, kind of evolutionary cognitive anthropologists, to see it as a maladaptive byproduct. You kind of think, that doesn't make any sense at all from a behavioural ecology, from an evolutionary biology point of view. This trait, trait, whatever it is, cultural trait is far too costly to just be a byproduct of something. There may well be byproducts involved. So, can we construct, if you like, a, 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 an argument that places religion as part and parcel of the evolution of sociality in general, presumably? So I'm going to try and do that for you. Um, let me just start very briefly by summarising the, just to provide the context, summarising the conventional view, which I'm quite happy with, on the historical uh, evolution of uh, religions. Uh, this has been the view since certainly the kind of late 19th century, um, that all early religions were Animist in form was the term that they would have used. It kind of went out of fashion as a term, but I think it's actually quite appropriate for it. Um, 
intensely built round uh, trance states. These are Kong San hunter gatherers uh, engaged in a trance dance. The women sitting, singing, and clapping at the back while the men uh, go in, uh, dance and go into trance. But uh, they're very immersive in that sense. There are no uh, priests, there are no temples, there's no th theology, there isn't even a divine moral code. It's, it's just a very simple, expressive kind of activity. And then eventually we end up with these things. Uh, I guess that's a Catholic mass up there, high mass somewhere. Um, and these are Zoroastrians, um, Parsis. shunted out of Persia uh, sometime at the um, end of the first millennium. Um, uh, and and, and Zoroastrians are interesting, actually, because all the Abrahamic religions owe their origins. So Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, Mithra, Mithra no, there's the two others, uh, and just about still there's the five Abrahamic religions go back to and drew heavily on Zoroastrianism, which the Jews picked up during their exile um, in Babylon or somewhere like that. Um, but in between these two, so these are very formal religions. They have temples, they have uh, uh, priests and hierarchies and moral codes handed down and a, by a single god in most cases who, uh, so it's monotheistic, overlooks and is very interested in what humans do. But in between, there's a bunch of doctrinal religions um, <clears throat> uh, that are, are polytheistic, have many gods. Uh, many of them are very old, all the old European uh, pre-Christian religions are of this kind. These are obviously Egyptians, a uh, West African, uh, current West, West African uh, original um, uh, tribal um, uh, religion, I'm sure which in particular is uh, one it is, but there we go. So what seems to happen is you start with these very, very early on, and they're very ancient. These kind of pitch up around about probably 8,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age, the beginning of the Neolithic. And then these kick in and appear within a very sh brief time frame, round about, from around about three and a half thousand years ago up until about one and a half thousand years ago. So this, this period from 1500 BC to about 500 AD, which is sometimes known as the Axial Age. And all these big world religions appear in that time frame. So they're out of the blue. And I'm going to try and explain why this should have happened. <coughs> Seems to remember hunter-gatherer type religions are based on trance states, they're highly mystical, they're a sense of the, wo the world is full of spirits, every tree and spring, and, uh, river and mountain uh, has, has its uh, uh, sort of spirits associated with it. Uh, there isn't a formal sense of a god, any gods, but there's this, certainly this engagement with the spirit world, as it were. And it's very much based on trance, almost universally in all living uh, hunter-gatherer type religions. My pitch here is going to be that never went away. There's been a tendency, at least by the theologians, predominantly I guess, to see these doctrinal, and particularly the revealed religions, these axial aid religions, who all claim to have uh, had some uh, God uh, telling somebody directly what the true religion is. Um, uh, all, all of these t tended to, to see them uh, 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 as completely replacing the ancestral animist religions. And I'm going to put it to you, no way. There is a very, very strong mystical tradition based on trance uh, throughout all, certainly all the uh, existing revealed or world religions as we know them today. These are the famous whirling dervishes from in this case, Turkey, one of the Sufi sects of Islam. Um, this is St. Teresa of Avila, uh, the Spanish saint, um, uh, renowned for, amongst many other things, uh, falling into trance. It's Bernini 
this statue of her. And just to suggest that, that how deeply embedded this kind of uh, very old uh, component is, you know, we, all the religions we have, the big religions still go in for foretelling the future, or at least we would like the future foretell. That's why you all go, I'm sure, every uh, uh, morning, check your horoscope in the newspaper, um, <coughs> especially if you've got exams coming up. Uh, uh, things to, uh, to avoid bad luck and the evil eye. The evil eye was very prevalent throughout Southern Europe until well into the 1940s, if, if not still with us. Praying for success in ventures, praying for success in love, praying for, praying for success in curing illnesses, and not least, absolving the dead. That is the Oracle of Delphi, the very famous uh, foretelling uh, 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 women who told foretold the future. They, I think the, the oracles uh, existed for something like 1,500 years before they were suppressed. People came from all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. um, this is St. Non's well, Holy Well in Pembrokeshire. Um, and if you go into any church, any Anglican, and probably Catholic, well, in Catholic church, anywhere, necessarily, other forms of Protestantism, there are things you do inside the church uh, uh, for the benefit of uh, absolving the dead, your, your family members or friends or whoever who, who died to absolve their sins. And what's more, all this stuff about praying for success, just look inside the door in any Anglican church and there's a, 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 a thing on the uh, board on the wall there for people to put uh, prayer requests, pray, pray for me, I've got uh, terrible illness, pray for me, I've got exams coming up. Um, uh, they're all there, one of the college chapels I'm sure, certainly ours are in, in Oxford. Um, <clears throat> and if you want a really weird thing, nothing beats this. Uh, this is a <laughs> Um, the curious world of the village sin eater in the Welsh marches, so the, the Welsh border counties and Shropshire uh, on, on the English side, um, which ran for many centuries. This is the grave of the last known village sin eater, Richard Munslow, <laughs> who died in 1906, so we're talking about only 100 years ago. You can go and see the grave, it's in Rattling Hope Church in Shropshire. So uh, you uh, laid the body out in your front room and you put a plate on the chest with salt and bread and the salt uh, took the sins out of the body into the bread and then just before the corpse was carted off to the church for the funeral the village sin eater came and ate the bread and took on to usually himself uh, occasionally it would be women but most of them were men um, uh, 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 and uh, your relative could go off to the next world, sin-free, as it were. And of course, you have to pay them a few pennies, and preferably uh, a pint of beer uh, was part of the deal. Um, um, interestingly, the sin eaters were usually, uh, they were usually poor old people. So this is how they earned some money. Um, but they were regarded, because they had this con connection with sin, regarded as sort of, you know, definitely uh, excluded, as it were. accepted within the community. Anyway, so my argument is the reason people belong to any religion has nothing to do with theological reasons. Nobody I've ever heard of has ever joined a religion for purely theological reasons. They've joined for emotional reasons. They've had a, well, either they were born into it, and, and in, if you like, indoctrinated into it from, from childhood, or if they're an adult, they have some very intense emotional uh, conversion experience. And these are often extremely deeply um, emotional. And there is a very much a sense of, kind of, the, the sense of, the best word to describe it actually is divine love, uh, as used in the Christian context, I guess. And you see this coming up time and time again in the writings of the mystics, the Christian mystics. Here's St. Therese of Lisieux, uh, died 1897 only. Um, very interesting family. It's the only family 
to have not only her as a saint, but one of her sisters is sort of halfway there, I think. But her parents are both saints. It's the only case in the Catholic Church where a couple, a married couple, the saints. Um, but Teresa of Lisieux is the second most famous saint in Catholicism. The only one who's more widely kind of uh, popular is St. Francis of Assisi. She was only 24 when she died. And at the request of her sisters, who were her superiors uh, at various points, they were her mother's superiors, she was asked to write her story. Because she was in charge of the postulants, the, the new uh, nuns, before they became fully, fully uh, um, uh, took their vows, as it were. And if you read it, it's really interesting stuff to read <laughs> when you can't, can't face another look at the chemistry textbook. Um, but it's full of this kind of stuff. I mean, this is, this is, this is just romantic love, uh, but directed uh, in, in, in a virtual uh, domain, as it were, rather than as a, 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 a real living person. So, <coughs> that's the background. I'm going to try and answer three questions. Why and when did religions evolve at all? Which is really about these kind of animist religions of hunter-gatherers. Secondly, why did the doctrinal religion, uh, religions appear when they did? We know when they did. That's about uh, eight, eight to nine thousand years ago only. And then finally, why did the revealed religions appear um, just about the time of uh, uh, um, Christ, in fact? Um, okay, so there have been lots of su suggestions as to the function of religion might serve. The main ways that these uh, uh, grey shaded boxes here. Uh, as usual with all these things, I get very irritated, frankly, with most of um, evolutionary folk and behavioural ecologists in particular, and, uh, as they do evolutionary stuff, because they tend to fixate on one favourite um, uh, hypothesis and ignore everything else. And very often, it's the everything else that actually is the most interesting. So this is my attempt just to provide a kind of um, systematic view. Biology is a systemic discipline, right? And a lot of these kind of studies tend to approach it like psychologists. There's a simple cause effect. Uh, and for biological studies, that's completely irrelevant. Biology is a systemic discipline. You've got lots of things going on, many of which are constraints, and a lot of which are consequences of something, a trait evolving. And that's what I'm trying to suggest here that what's actually happening is there are external threats which are demanding uh, groups of a certain size uh, to uh, control them. We've got a problem about group bonding and there are various components of that as a whole other story in there perhaps, um, but religion is part of that group bonding process and then once you have that little uh, L-shaped loop in place, all sorts of other things happen. Elites arise as kind of an automated consequence of network structures, which we can now show is actually the case. And cooperation becomes a consequence of living in groups. It's not a cause of living in groups. It's often interpreted as a cause. It, there's no way it can be called. Well, that's why everybody has so much trouble trying to produce a coherent uh, mathematical explanation for um, the evolution of cooperation, because they're assuming it's evolving for its own sake. It's not, it's just a consequence of group bonding, basically. Okay, so that's the framework. There are all sorts of knock-on consequences on the side which are interesting. So religion actually does have a benefit for your health. I'm sorry to have to tell you, unless you convert immediately, your life is going to be much shorter, and it's full of misery. <laughs> uh, it can't be that bad. <laughs> anyway. That's the, the central point. Um, so, group bonding. Here's, here's the issue with the evolution of groups in all mammals. This is a problem faced by all mammals. Is living in groups is extremely stressful. Relationships are extremely stressful. In case you haven't discovered. <laughs> This is, this is the single most important constraint acting on the evolution of group size in mammals. 
nothing to do with ecology, nothing. It's a complete red herring. Uh, I'm sorry to have to tell it. <laughs> uh, but it's just because of the way we ecologists have thought everything looks like food. It's not. Here's the big problem. And it comes in two forms. Internal stresses uh, and external stresses. Uh, you know, it's as hell's angels riding their bicycles or bikes around the village green at midnight on a Saturday, just making a nuisance of themselves. So these are creating major, major stresses. So these internal stresses of that kind, but also, of course, a lot of this is raiders, which is what the whoever they are, <coughs> Game of Thrones, probably. Um, this is your neighbours, you know, raiding you, and that, that's a major, major problem. In order to live in big groups, mammals have to solve this problem, this, and particularly, well, I'll uh, come back to it in a second, let me first show you some evidence for that. This is the proportion of all mort mortality that's due to homicide in living hunter-gatherer groups. So this is mean, mean group size for the tribe, those are the um, uh, mortality rates homicide rates and you can see it is absolutely big <coughs> and it goes up so fast that hunter gatherers could not live in groups well they can't live in groups bigger than 90 if they lived in groups bigger than 90 all deaths would be due to homicide and since homicide tends to hit younger people more than old people they would never reproduce they would be dying before they reproduce you do not get groups of hunter gatherers living groups of hunter gatherers fan size that are bigger than 50 and at that point, they're running between 50 and 60 percent of mortality as homicides. This is homicides within the group, within the band. This is not raiding, although that, that doesn't help. Um, this is just grumpy men, right? And this is the other problem. We've known about this problem since the 1980s. We just never realised what, what the implications are. The amount of evidence now that fertility declines and declines precipitously with the number of females in the group comes from all over the entire mammal kingdom. Primates, humans, carnivores, equids, rodents, everywhere. It's a generic mammalian problem. It is so steep in sort of not very social mammals, that they cannot have more than about five females living together in a group. So it's a massive constraint on the size of groups you can have. It's quite clearly why uh, most mammals live in very small groups or are solitary. In fact, in those species, the optimal group size for a female is one female. For every female you add, you, you lose fertility. All of you lose fertility. We know what the mechanism is, that was worked out by a bunch of reproductive biologists in the 80s. I'm not going to go into it, I uh, just want to show you that there is some uh, 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 grounds for uh, believing this. Very basic, some of it was worked out here actually. Uh, <clears throat> question is how do primates solve this problem in order to live in big groups and by extension ourselves? The way they've done it is female coalitions, <coughs> female alliances. So females form these very tightly bonded grooming alliances which protect them from the others in the group but don't drive everybody away. It's really very subtle in the sense that it's on a knife edge because they have, if they were too aggressive about stopping other people treading on their toes, because it's not, it's not sort of fisticuffs, this is the London commuter problem, it's just people tre tre literally treading on your toes because you're all so crammed in when you're, when you're foraging. So you want to just keep people off your back a little bit, but not drive them out of the group, otherwise you lose the benefit of being in the group. <clears throat> and this works, it turns out, essentially this bonding process, the dual process mechanism, you've got this grooming activity which triggers the endorphin system, worked out by Barry Caverne originally, from just down the road in Kings, um, still just down the road in Kings. Uh, he was the one that first showed the endorphin system underpinning grooming, and then what grooming does provides a kind of pharmacological platform off which <coughs> animals can use their big brains to build relationships of trust and obligation and reciprocity. That's what's going on in this 
still works in humans. These are <coughs> some of our data from uh, PET scanning uh, studies that we, uh, my collaborators in Finland, uh, ran, um, showing that uh, we had a bunch of blokes uh, in PET scanners, pretty nasty stuff, PET, PET scanning uh, our machines. We, we did only blokes because that's it's quite common to do single sex experiments in your bar. Neuro, neuroimaging because it's such such messy stuff that you're trying to remove as much of the things. But we thought if we could show it in blokes, something social, we could show it in anybody. <laughs> <laughs> These are their brains. These are the brain endorphin receptors going crazy while they're being stroked by their uh, uh, partners. And these are fins, so they don't get excited. They're very calm and relaxed. So, <laughs> <coughs> and they weren't allowed to go above the neck or below the uh, belt. Right? <laughs> the brain is still going absolutely crazy. And we do it all the time. We just don't think about it. Constantly uh, touching, patting, and hugging, and all these kind of things that we do in, in conversation with each other. But we don't think about, but boy, are you having a good time? <laughs> we also know now exactly how this works. Again, I'm not going to go into it, but I just want to show you that there is some serious stuff. This is not idle speculation on my part. There's an entirely specialized neural system that has receptors all over the skin that responds to one thing, stimulus, and one stimulus only. That is light, slow stroking at three centimeters a second. You want to test it? Try stroking or cuddling with your partner at approximately one centimeter a second, and they won't, you know, you won't even budge. Uh, try doing it at 30 centimeters a second. These experiments have been done, by the way. Um, uh, and particularly with babies, you can do it with, with newborn babies and stop them crying or not. Right? So if you do it one centimeter a second or 30 centimeters a second, doesn't have any effect at all. Get it right at three centimeters a second, uh, it'll be nirvana for your grooming <laughs> uh, partner. Uh, but ba newborn babies will stop crying instantly. That's why we rock them. Right? They calm them down. It turns out that the inner ear is full of these receptors. Every time we shake the head, it triggers them like crazy. That's why we shake our heads when we're dancing. So we've actually done these experiments now. People listening to music and show that if they shake their heads in time, in time to the music, as opposed to out of time to the music, they get an endorphin. Magic. Okay. <clears throat> so in some sense, here's the problem, the central problem that we try to deal with. Everybody uses phys physical grooming, as it were, for bonding their groups. There is a pretty linear relationship between time devoted grooming and group size. The, the reasons for that are much more complicated than a simple linear process. But it means that we can <coughs> kind of look at, oh, uh, one other point, no primate spends more than 20% of its daytime grooming. That is a lot. That's one-fifth of the day spent grooming. Right? <coughs> Even President Clinton not inhaling uh, when he was a road scholar at Oxford, wouldn't have been so high if, uh, uh, as you would feel if you spent 20% of your day cuddling with somebody. Absolutely. <laughs> but that's uh, it's all the time, but that's the upper limit for primates. So this is estimating for every single uh, major fossil group in humans what the grooming time requirement would be for their group sizes. So, taking the social brain relationships that calculate group size and then taking the primate grooming to group size equations to calculate grooming. And you see it's going up nicely. Astronomical the scenes, it's just apes really. Nothing interesting going on there. Uh, no problem. Once you get to the appearance of the genus Homo, it stops and up and it just goes up and up. So the bonding gap there is the deficit because even we only spend about 20% of our time engaged in social interaction benchmarked by lots of data from time budgets, from people, from 
all sorts of different cultures and economies around the world. So we spend as much time rooming, effectively, as primates do, but somehow we use that time more efficiently to groom a much larger group of people who would normally require us to spend nearly half our day uh, in grooming. So this is how we did it. We've discovered a whole bunch of things which trigger the endorphin system like crazy. The oldest of these is laughter, which is why it's kind of um, it's very spontaneous. Uh, uh, you can't always control. Well, the best laughter is uncontrolled. Um, and it's universal and we share it with great things. Then the singing without words, dancing, uh, the rituals of religion, eating and drinking alcohol. Alcohol is a very strong trigger for the endorphin system, by the way. It's what gives you the pleasurable effect. So the, as, you, as you will all know, having been to Alcoholics Clinic, um, what they do now is they give you endorphin blockers to block up the, all the receptors so you don't get the hit. Very cool. It gives you a kind of cold turkey, but it works. Um, and then emotional storytelling in particular, so sad storytelling. And for all of these, we've shown they trigger the endorphin system and they increase the sense of bonding. Oh, okay, I forgot. This is when I think they came in, in, in each of those three blocks came into being. Okay, here's just a, a very brief summary. Again, I'm not going to go into it, I want to show you. There is some data there. Uh, 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 just a compilation of lots of experiments that we've done over the last 20 odd years on various different aspects of this. Um, <clears throat> uh, at the top, showing a change in rate, bonding rating uh, between control groups who are not doing the activity, singing, dancing, whatever, and experimental groups who are. And then uh, the, some of the evidence for endorphins. And we either do that through pain assays, uh, pain tests, um, or through uh, naltrexone controls, so giving them uh, endorphin blockers, which prevent them getting the endorphin hit. You can see the uh, pain threshold drops dramatically with the naltrexone, or in some cases, with, uh, we've done it with um, neuroimaging as well. In fact, uh, that is one. For our neuroimage experiments, this is the laughter again done by our Finnish collaborators. You can see the brain absolutely going crazy, absorbing endorphins that are being pumped out. Just watching um, a uh, funny film. Oh, now, doesn't want to move on. Oh, come on. Oh, there we go. Right. So we've now done a number of these studies with uh, in religious contexts. They're mostly done by um, uh, 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 Sarah Charles there on the right, uh, 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 who is a graduate student of Miguel Farias at, at Coventry University, was part of a, a project with me. And they did a bunch of Chris Christian, Protestant and Roman Catholic services. The kind of Pentecostals were very nervous and wouldn't allow us in. Um, Sarah went out to Brazil with one of my collaborators in anthropology, from Oxford uh, and ran the same studies uh, on uh, these um, uh, Umbanda um, uh, Afro Caribbean uh, stroke Catholic syncretic religion. So they 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 it's all based on trance. So here's a, uh, uh, there's the sort of chief priestess, as it were. There's a lot been a lot of dancing going on with the musicians at the back, and then this. Uh, woman here on, on the left is going into trance. Um, uh, so it's all based around that. They all have Yoruba gods parallel to all the Catholic saints. Mm -hmm. right, so e each god, if you like, has two names, a Catholic name and a Yoruba name. Um, <clears throat> very, very popular. It's about 120 year, years old, early part of the 20th century. It started up in Brazil. Very, very popular. We did it on four Sunday assemblies which is kind of Anglican services without the theology. It was started by a couple of comedians <laughs> because they missed choral even song uh, from their childhood. And so they had the idea of creating a kind of church service where all the sort, same sort of things go on. Stories are told, a reading for something, sing a song, um, uh, uh, somebody gives a little sermony type thing, but there's no 
religious component is purely secular, and it's sort of quite popular, particularly in the English-speaking world. <coughs> it's still very strong. Um, we ran some yoga classes put on by uh, the lady on the bottom right, uh, who's a, uh, a yogi from Reading, and she ran the classes uh, in two separate groups of classes. One, they all did the same exercise, but one lot were told the yoga theory and the religious component, the other lot were just given a straight physic, physics, sorry, physiological explanation. We did do it on some mosques as well, uh, but unfortunately, lockdown to be, and in the end we decided we didn't have enough data to include the mosques, which was a pity, because uh, they were showing pretty much the same thing. Anyway, just to give you a sense of the data, these are our bonding indexes, very simple bonding. You have to have bonded, do you feel, to the other members of the community, the, the, the congregation. So they're tested pre-service and post-service. You can see both for the churches and the Sunday assembly, it's going up. Uh, and the endorphin tests, where they have to do these pain <coughs> threshold changes for us, shows echo the same thing. And these are the now Traxone experimental interventions that we did on the Umbanda. Uh, groups in Brazil and on the open groups. And you can see the placebo, you've got the same pattern, the endorphins are kicking in, uh, pain threshold, bonding index and pain thresholds are higher, and the now Traxone ones, they drop because they, they're not getting the endorphin kick. And these are data from a survey uh, that I ran, a national survey, looking at uh, various standard measures that the, the government statisticians use uh, for assessing people's well-being and the like as a function in this particular case of how often they went to church as a measure of how intensely uh, religious they were. And, and those are the data for their sense of belonging uh, to being bonded with the other members of their congregation. You can see the more often they go, the higher it is. And these, these are the um, standard deviations for uh, um, the they are large samples, but the, the standard deviations are very, very tight. But all these show the same thing. Bonding to the congregation is higher. The number of friends they have is higher. Sometimes they will actually say, people at this end will actually say, they, uh, people at this end, that's say, you not me. If, if, what the question is, how many people uh, would you regard as shoulders to cry on friends? Deep moments of trauma. How many people would you go to and ask them to, you know, uh, hold your hand and, 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 and walk you through it, as it were? Or you know, if you need to borrow a large sum of money from somebody, uh, who would you go to? Most of us will say around about five people. It's such a robust effect. It's unbelievable. Um, <clears throat> some of these people at the daily end are claiming to have eighty, eight zero. The whole congregation, basically. They think of their uh, personal friends. Trust in the local community, that's kind of interesting. Uh, they're more trusting of the local wider community. They're more engaged with their wider local community. They have a sense that life is much more worthwhile, feel happier, less depressed, all sorts of things like that. So, <clears throat> if religion is about community bonding, is there an optimal congregation size? The answer is yes. Lots and lots of data on this. <laughs> I'll just show you these because they kind of fun. <coughs> the 19th century American utopian communes or communities. The Americans had a big fashion for these, uh, um, and they all went out into the. I mean, a lot of them you know, the religious ones, uh, you, you will know. They're people like the Shakers, the Mormons, the Hutterites, all these many, many others. <coughs> the secular ones you will never have heard of <laughs> uh, because they disappeared very quickly, usually because somebody, the, the, the founder, either ran off with the community's money <laughs> or with the community's wives. <laughs> <laughs> so their lifespan was extremely short. Um, uh, uh, the average is about 10 years, in fact, whereas the average lifespan for religious communes is about 70 years. And as, as I said, some of them are still going strong. But there's an interesting distinction <coughs> between the sizes of foundation. Secular ones tended to be only 50 in size, religious ones average 150. Um, uh, 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 so they, somehow the religious component allows them 
to have a bigger group to hold it together. Uh, um, and this is very much, this is a kind of slightly complicated analysis, but it's analysis of the optimal <coughs> size for duration, maximizing duration. And you can see they're very close to those, 64 and 170. Uh, so again, you know, something in, in the religious communes is allowing them to, 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 to survive much longer because it's dampening, somehow it's dampening the frictions that would otherwise normally burst out. Now this is just a reminder relative to this, this value here of the religious ones, the average group size uh, there at 150, of the, the single most important effect uh, we have, and that is the average group size for humans. They don't understand last number. This is value of 150. So here's the 150. This is just a summary of, I don't know, about 25 studies, I think, that are incorporated here. Um, <clears throat> broken up into the kinds of data um, uh, that they're based on, but here's church congregation sizes down here. This value of 150 is predicted <coughs> back of the regression equations for uh, primate, the primate social brain data. Um, it has modestly wide but not impossible uh, confidence intervals around it, but just look how tightly the averages cluster around the predicted values. And these are 95% confidence intervals for these data sets, and some of them, a lot of them, are enormous. I think of, of these 25, I think 10 have more than 10,000 people in the sample. The winner is the infamous Facebook study on published in PNAS about 10 years ago. Who, who, without realizing what they were saying, said they have 61 million Facebook pages. The average number of friends on these 61 Facebook pages, which they state, is 149. <laughs> I don't often get predictions that close. <laughs> so, on the basis of that, I'm going past go. I'm collecting my $200. And I'm buying both of Abramovich's yachts. <laughs> <laughs> and the next meeting will be courtesy of me. I'll fly you all out to the Caribbean and uh, we'll have the next talk out there. Okay, right. So let's get back to the issue. When might. So we have some evidence that religion seems to work very well in bonding, uh, small groups in particular. When might it evolve, have evolved when we can get at this indirectly <coughs> by. Noticing two things about religion. One is you need language in it. So it has to evolve after the evolution of language. So if we can place the evolution of language, that gives us a bottom line. And that's simply because no matter what theological, clever theological thoughts you think, if you can't explain them to somebody else and persuade them to join or to believe you, you've not got a religion. You've got a private religion, you've not got a communal religion. For communal religion, we need language. And the other one is mentalizing. You have to be able to detach yourself from the physical world in which you live, take your nose off the grindstone, as it were, step back far enough to be able to think about uh, uh, other possibilities, other possible worlds, and other people's mind states and beliefs. And if, uh, if uh, we know a lot about this stuff now, theory of mind or mentalizing, uh, <clears throat> we may be able to use that as a kind of um, uh, 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 scalpel, as it were, in identifying when uh, uh, human species, hominid species, acquired sufficiently high mental states, capacities to be able to think deep theological thoughts. So just a reminder for those of you who are not psychologists, this is what we're talking about. Uh, it's this capacity to Im uh, imagine somebody, so Jack Hares and what's called first order uh, intentionality. Um, he, 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 he knows the contents of his own mind, some fact about the world. Uh, Jill uh, believes that Jack believes that something's the case here. She's in uh, second order intentionality. That's what kids acquire at about the age of five or so. And it sort of goes on increasing. Adults can manage, uh, on all our tests, we've never really got one past that. Fifth order, so you can think about four other mind states. 
but what I need to be shown that that's the case, we've even shown that Shakespeare sticks religiously, sorry, unreligiously, <laughs> <laughs> to these limits when he's uh, 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 having, he never has more than four speakers on the stage at any one time. Because if he did, he would overtax the audience. But even, we've even shown that jokes, stand up comedy jokes, and cartoons, believe it or not, newspaper cartoons, adhere to this rule. They never push the reader or the audience beyond fifth order. If they do, what we've shown it with some, it's like reading a postmodern novel. You can't see what the joke is, it's just too complicated. So, okay, that's, that's the sequence that forms the natural uh, uh, sequence. Um, and we can construct, if you like, what's going on in a religious environment uh, in these terms. Here's a second order uh, statement about religion. This is his stuff, literally. And here's something much more complicated, but once we get up here, it seems we basically, you, you, you're almost forcing the other person to agree with you. Uh, it's very difficult to get out of it. Uh, it seems to change the structure of the argument cognitively, uh, and that's fifth order. So um, uh, what we're looking for is the point at which fifth order appears in the course of human evolution. Now the reason we can do that, it turns out from the neuroimaging experiments we've done, that your mentalizing capacities, and, and adult humans, the average is five, but it varies from about three to, to six across normal adult humans, that correlates with the size of your mentalizing circuit. And therefore, we can figure out what all the <clears throat> Fossils did, here, and here they are. These are monkeys down here, these are apes. Uh, these are their mentalizing circles. So the ape, great apes are the only species that's the money theory of mind, second order intentionality. And these are the estimates for, uh, so these are just the averages, there's variants around each of them, from all the various species up to anatomically modern human fossils. So these are not modern modern humans, these are fossil modern humans. Um, uh, so, That's a basic theory of mind. The five-year-olds can see the great apes and the astrologer 